Okay. Welcome, why don't y'all take your hymn books, hymn number 22, let's all stand, we'll sing, Are You Washed in the Blood, hymn number 22, let's all stand and sing together. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His graces now? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you formed spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Hymn number 22, we're on that second. Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Rest each moment in the crucified. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Excellent singing. Please be seated. Thank you very much, Thomas. Good to see you all this evening. It's such a blessing to be back in the Lord's house tonight. And let's have a word of prayer and we'll get things started this evening. Brother Jeremy, if you would, sir, would you please lead us in prayer tonight? Amen. Please be seated. And so nice to see you all tonight. Uh, it's our second night of our uh, special meeting, of course, our anniversary celebration. So we're looking forward to some more preaching tonight from uh, Brother Gable. And also, of course, tomorrow we'll continue with our celebration in the afternoon. We'll be all heading over to uh, Dennis and Donna Street's place over there in Smithville and looking forward to a wonderful time hanging out in the backyard, getting the fire pit going and having some hobo stew. And so we'll be having a, a pot of, um, of, of um, kind of a soup base with meat in it. And asking you, please, just bring some canned, uh, canned goods in that'll go in the stew. So whatever you bring, vegetables or, you know, um, no, no, uh, nothing too weird, okay? And you know me, I eat all kinds of weird stuff, but I can't, uh, you know, I can't take what, it's palatable to me and inflict it all on your on you. 
And so uh, we'll be monitoring that, but uh, pretty much anything that comes in, we'll open up the cans and just pour it in. And that's, that's our hobo stew. So please bring canned goods with you tomorrow, uh, and we'll have a meal together. Of course, the sign-up sheet's in the back there, and I saw the thing was filled up, and thank you for that. So uh, side dishes and desserts, and we're just going to have a great time of fellowship and as we celebrate our church's anniversary. Uh, just one more uh, announcement to make. I mean, besides the service times this weekend, of course, 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock, um, but um, we're going to be helping out uh, Brother Jerry Wilhite. When he was with us uh, digitally uh, several weeks ago, the question was asked uh, to him uh, if, uh, you know, what kind of financial needs or other ministry needs he had, and he had mentioned that desire of, uh, of renting a, a billboard and advertising Bible studies and trying to get um, this on, kind of an online type thing through WhatsApp. Many, many, uh, it's a popular app here in this country, but it's extremely popular overseas. A lot of people use WhatsApp. We, we personally, we use it too. Um, but you can do a lot of things through that. And so um, he's hoping to start uh, conducting some Bible studies through that. So he's going to be advertising for it. And so he put that out. I, I put the letter in the back there. So many of you fellows read that online, of course, when I posted it the other, uh, the other day. Uh, but we want to help out with that. That was the need that he expressed to us directly. I don't think he had advertised it anywhere yet. Uh, and we were just having a conversation. I talked to him a, a week or so after he was with us, and I asked him some more questions about it. He gave me a little bit more detail as far as the particulars. And uh, he, so he was still considering it, and so he decided he was going to go with it. Um, and uh, so we want, we want to help him out. So we're going to start this, uh, I mean, even if you want to put some money in uh, the box tonight, that's fine too. Just make sure that you indicate that it's going to go to Brother Wilhite. So you can write Australia or you can write Brother Wilhite, um, anything like that. And we'll make sure that it goes directly to everything that comes in for that is going to go directly to him. The church is going to be contributing directly out of our missions fund also. But anything else that comes in is going to go together. We'll be sending that over to Lehigh Valley Baptist Church. And uh, Jer Brother Jer as I mentioned last night, Brother Jerry had to come up with the money up front to get the ball rolling in order to uh, get a substantial discount uh, for paying for a year ahead of time. And so that's what he's already done in order to get the ball rolling. And so we're going to help replenish those funds that he's already drafted out of his work funds. Um, and so whatever comes in is going to go to that. So we're going to get started immediately with that. So whatever you give, I do want to say thank you ahead of time. And uh, we're looking forward to being a, um, a big help to him in this. I am i don't know how it's going to play through in the future throughout this up and coming year, but uh, hopefully he's going to have a lot of Bible studies requests coming in. And uh, there may be some more needs in the future with that, um, but uh, I'm just looking forward to seeing what God's going to do with that. And I want to say thank you uh, for your willingness and your generosity towards that to begin with. But pray about that, because all the money, all the money that can be given uh, is of little effect unless it's uh, bathed in prayer. And so be praying for Brother Jerry Wilhite, the work of the ministry there, in particular, this ministry. Okay, but that's all I have to say. Um, we have a special. We do have a special, and then uh, we're going to get right to the preaching. So, uh, ladies, if you would, please. me 
beautiful song. All righty. Well, I'm looking forward to the preaching tonight, and I uh, hope that you'll be blessed by it. So, Brother Gable, if you would, sir, why don't you come and preach the Word of God tonight? <laughs> yes, I did. I did. I said it. Oh, it's going to fall. <clears throat> Somebody came. To, I didn't even get one of those in my own church. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll open it up on the on the counter outside later. On the Lord, no, oh no, 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 no. I, I know better than that. <laughs> I might be dumb, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> oh, amen. <clears throat> well, thank you, good crowd tonight. Appreciate you being here, amen. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, try to be a blessing here at New Testament Baptist Church and the hospitality of Brother Shorter. Appreciate that very much. I appreciate your prayers for us at Haven Baptist Church. We've been looking for a building for a long time. And there's just nothing in our area that seems to be opening up, not in our price range anyway. So uh, you keep us in your prayers. You may want to consider this, Chuck. What we're doing this uh, coming Sunday is we're celebrating Easter in October. Yeah, while the world is celebrating death, we're celebrating life in Christ. Amen. Especially this year, because we weren't meeting in April. We weren't meeting over the Easter holiday. So uh, we're celebrating Easter in October. We did it a couple years ago. And it was always very popular. I don't remember why we stopped, but uh, we're re rechristening it, bringing it out of the closet, amen, and using it again. So uh, it's a good draw. I put a, a notice up on Facebook, got a lot of good comments on it. People like the idea, especially with all that's going on in our world today, amen. Well, if you take your Bibles, please, and join me in Acts chapter 20. Uh, we're going to return. Oops, that's right. I turned it off so I wouldn't accidentally hit it. Uh, I'm just sharing a couple of messages with you from our study in Acts, standing in awe of the activity in Acts, because I believe they are important as far as the health and well-being of a local New Testament assembly, uh, a church, and personal relationships. And here in Acts chapter 20, of course, we started looking at the first half last week. Well, we ha uh, last week, yeah, when I preached this before, it was last week. Last night, I'll, I'll get it right, amen. Uh, last night we looked at the first 16 verses. Tonight we're going to pick things up in verse 17 here in just a moment. But uh, I, first of all, I just want to say that this, th these verses really appear to be somewhat of a biographical sketch of the Apostle Paul. Talking about his interaction with people, his preaching of God's Word, and, and how he fulfilled the ministry. And, and, and that's why I've entitled this message, The Pattern of Paul. The Pattern of Paul it's a pattern of preaching, and it's a pattern of interaction with, with other believers and with lost people too, that really every, every true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ ought to desire to emulate, to incorporate these items into their life. You know, the Apostle Paul many times urged his readers to follow his example. Let me give you a couple of verses up on the screen if you want to see there. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have me, uh, have us for an example. Then to the believers at Corinth, he wrote in 1 Corinthians 4, 16, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Then to those in Thessalonica, he wrote in 2 Thessalonians 3, 7, For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. Now, some people might look at those statements and consider those exhortations to be a matter of arrogance and pride on Paul's part. But as Paul states here in, in Acts chapter 20, verse 19, they were not, those statements are not based on pride. They're not based on ego or arrogance. Paul's exhortations are really founded in, in humility. A very essential character trait of a believer. I mean, you, you think of it, Paul referred to himself as the least of the apostles in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, 15 verse 9. Uh, less than the least of the saints in Ephesians 3, 8, and the chief of all sinners in 1 Timothy 1, 15. You see, Paul did not, Paul never set himself forth as a pattern to follow because of himself, as some might, some might think would be arrogant of him. But rather, Paul set himself forth as an example to follow, a pattern to emulate, solely because of who it was that he was following. That was the key. 
In 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul wrote these words, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And the reason, that, uh, the reason why the, the pattern that we see in Paul is a pattern that's worthy of you and I patterning in our own lives. The, the, the truth of the matter is, Paul was a humble man. And humility is a characteristic that, in God's eyes, is a characteristic that's worth its weight in truth. It has extreme value. God saves humble individuals. People who will humble themselves before Him, realizing they're a lost sinner in need of a Savior. And then God uses humble saints in order to serve Him. A humble spirit is required for salvation, and a humble spirit is required for service, if we're going to serve the Lord our God. So now with all that being said, let's take a look at this pattern that, that Paul set forth in his dealings, specifically with the believers in Ephesus, and six things in particular that we can apply, that we can see from this pattern and apply to our own personal lives. So look with me, if you would, at Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 17. I'll read down to the end of the chapter. Verse 17 says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders, that he is Paul, uh, Paul sent to the elders and called the elders of the church. And then when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide in me. But none of these things move me. This is a great verse. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore? I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous woods, wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch. And remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn uh, everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessity and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you might uh, you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. They all wept sore, fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him. Your precious Heavenly Father, we have a very sweet scene before us here this evening, here in Acts chapter 20. Very emotional scene. And I, I honestly don't believe that I, I, I did it justice in the way I read it. I'm sure there was more emotion in many of these words. Lord, in these words, in this somewhat of a biographical sketch that Paul puts forth here, that the Scriptures put forth here of him, Lord, I, think, I, I do believe that there are characteristics here that as we as believers incorporate these things, work on these things because many of them are just not natural to our flesh. And as we incorporate these things in our lives, we'll be vessels that are better fit for the Master's use. Please bless our time in the Scriptures, dear God, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> there can be little doubt about the fact that Paul, Paul loved these people. Paul cared greatly for these people. And these people loved him back. There, there can be little doubt about that. And there is no question in my mind that their love for him was founded principally in the pattern 
the pattern of life that Paul lived in front of them. That pattern is made up, as I said, of six things. And actually, last time I preached this message, I added a seventh, which I'll, Lord willing, share with you at the end. <clears throat> but the first element of this pattern of Paul is unmistakably the element of his compassion. His compassion. If you will recall from last night, back in verse 13, Paul sent his traveling companions on to their next port by ship. He waved goodbye as they, they left the dock and headed for the next port 24 miles down the sea. And he separated from them, and he journeyed from Troas to Assos alone on foot. We speculated last night that, that Paul used that time to get alone to the Lord. To get a hold of the throne of grace, to know God's will, to seek God's will as to what and, and where the Lord would have him to go. After Paul is reunited with his companions. It is said there in verse 16, for Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. From those words, I deduce, it, it, would, it would appear that Paul had indeed gotten some clear direction from God, from the Holy Spirit. He was determined to sail by Ephesus because, because of the great compassion that, that he felt in his heart for these believers. Yes, he wanted to get to Jerusalem, but there was another stop that he was determined to make. He determined to see them one more time. Now, do you ever think about, I know we don't usually think in these terms, but seeing someone for the last time. We usually don't think of it until someone's lying in their deathbed, or we are, sit deathly sick. If we treated every meeting with somebody as the last time we might see them, would we not speak differently? Would we not show maybe a little bit more emotion and, and concern and compassion for them? I think of so many people that when a parent or someone they knew they loved passed away, they had great regrets. The last time we spoke, we had an argument. <clears throat> last time, harsh words were exchanged. I never had the time. I never took the time to tell him I love him. You know, we need to think in those terms because so much of our world is so hard, so different from that, because they know not our God with love. Amen. Now, I believe here in this case that Paul was warned by God on that trip, on that long walk. He was warned that this was the last time that he would see these Ephesian believers this side of heaven. In verse 18, Paul refers to the manner in which he had dealt with them during the seasons he had been with them. There in verse 18, uh, <clears throat> or is it verse, verse 18? Yes, there it is. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. He, he, he reminds them of his testimony, if you will, and his compassion for them really is clearly seen in the, in the words that are used here in verse 19. It says, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. I, I'd like you to quickly, on this first point, I know there's six, but calm down, don't go fast, amen? <laughs> but three things here in particular about his compassion. First of all, there's a matter of his testimony. I've already mentioned the importance of humility. However, humility is so very important that I feel that, that I need to touch on it one more time. At least one more time. Humility speaks of lowliness of mind. Shall we say humility is a matter of having a proper understanding of our relationship with God, of who we are, and, of the other, and a proper relationship with people around us, with others. You see, Paul, I believe Paul had this understanding. Now, he didn't have it before, not before he was saved. Uh, he certainly, but he certainly did after. He was knocked off his high horse in Acts chapter 8, amen. After he was humbled. Before that, he proudly stood by and held the garments uh, of those that were, uh, he gave his blessing to those that were stoning godly Stephen. Uh, in, in order, and then in order to further his, his own personal agenda in Acts chapter 9, he was on his way to Damascus to, to apprehend any men, women, children, whatever, of this quote-unquote Christian way and bring them bound to Jerusalem. That, it was all about him. The last thing we would accuse Saul of having is compassion. 
That was before. That was B.C. <laughs> before Christ came into his life. There it was on the road to Damascus that Paul was knocked off his high horse. He was obviously humbled. And then he humbly spoke these words, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? It was there and then that Paul was saved, born again, and transformed into a new creature. Now, those things, those of the way that he once persecuted, he sought to capture and kill. Now he serves alongside of them with all humility. As I said earlier, humility is necessary first for salvation, and then if you're going to serve the Lord in any way, shape, or form, you need to be a humble individual. And if you have never humbled yourself before God, realize yourself to be a filthy sinner worthy of being sent into an eternity in hell, unable to save yourself. You've never had a point where you cried out to Him for salvation. Then, then I fear that you are, you've never truly been born again. And you're still on that broad road headed to the pace where you'll pay for your sin forever. So Paul, so as Paul commented here on his compassion toward them, he first pointed to his testimony, and then he talked there about his tears. His tears. Paul shed many a tear for these people, both before and after their salvation. Down in verse 31, Paul mentions his tears for them. Yet again, look in verse 31, it says there, <clears throat> Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. With tears. His great heart, his great compassion for these people brought him to tears on many an occasion. Sadly, this kind of compassion is lacking in Christianity today. And I say that to my own shame. We need to weep over the souls of those that are lost in their sin, as well as for one another at times. Consider David's words in the 119th Psalm, worth, worth one, Psalm, one, Psalm 119, verse 136. Uh, David wasn't crying for himself and his troubles here, but for those that kept not God's law. Notice he says there, rivers of waters run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. He was concerned for the lost, if you will. But David wasn't the only one. He wasn't the only one with his attitude. Consider the words of Jeremiah. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 17, he says, But if ye will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride, and mine eyes shall uh, weep sore and, and run down with tears, the, because, the Lord's, because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. These men, shed tears for their wayward countrymen. How often do we do that? I mean, it's easy for us to complain about what's going on in our country. <clears throat> That's the easy way out. How many times do we really pray? Sought the Lord's will, amen. The answer, I fear, to that question is not often enough. And I'm talking to myself when I say that, amen. Today, in many independent Baptist circles, we, we've been infected, we've been inflicted with an attitude of disgust. Oh, I hate that. I, we, we almost have an aloofness about us at times rather than a compassion for lost souls, for our country, for our world at large. Paul was able to weep. With tears. He talked about his testimony. He talked about his tears. Thirdly, he talked about his temptations there. His temptation. Paul warned them more than once. Paul was warned, rather, uh, of the Jews lying in wait for him. And armed with that kind of foreknowledge, you might say, where's the temptation and all that? Well, the temptation with that kind of foreknowledge, with knowing that bounds waited for him in Jerusalem, the temptation would be to change my plans. To go the other way. But Paul persevered through those temptations. Why? Why, why did he do that? Well, in Ephesus in particular, because he had a compassion for their souls. He was willing to face dangerous situations because of his compassion. I remind you that during that uproar over the goddess Diana, he wanted to rush out into the crowd and preach the gospel to them, but the, his friends held him back at that point, fearing for his life. But he was willing. He was willing to enter the theater and face the, face the, the scorn of the crowd. And that thought leads me right into the next element. Finally, we get to the second one. 
the next element in Paul's pattern. Not only is there compassion, but secondly, there's a matter of consistency in his life. And we see that in verses 20 and 21. Paul wasn't perfect. He clearly understood that. None of us is. That to the church at Philippi, uh, Paul wrote these words in Philippians 3.12, Not as though I had already attained, neither were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. So, so many people today, especially politicians, I don't know if you watched any of the debate last night, watched it for a little bit, that's all about 15 minutes, about what I could stomach, amen? But so many of them changed their message based on their audience. Mr. Biden had to do that today. <laughs> he had to do that this afternoon to correct something he said last night or to change or, well, anyway, you know what I mean, to massage what he said the night before. But Paul certainly was none of that number. He was not in that group. He was trustworthy. He was reliable. No, no matter what the setting, you could count on the Apostle Paul to speak up for Christ, regardless of how hopeless or how fruitless the situation might have appeared to be on the surface. Let, let's face it, many times we hold our tongue because we think, oh, that, he's too far gone. He doesn't want to hear it. I don't want to talk to him. It's just going to be an argument. Folks, time and time again in the Scriptures, God has told His preachers to go and preach without giving a guarantee of fruit. Noah comes to mind. 120 years of preaching. His family boarded the book. They are. To Jeremiah, the Lord said, Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Why? Because they were upset with him. I was just reading in Jeremiah this morning how, how uh, they came to him. I guess I think it's in chapter 43. Uh, the, the, most of Jerusalem, uh, most of the Jews had already been taken captive. He was left behind with some. And they said, please tell us what the Lord's will is. What we want to know. Jeremiah said, okay, I'll go to the Lord for you. He comes back and he tells them, don't go to Egypt, stay here. Oh, we don't want to do that. Wait a minute, you just told me that I, you were going to obey God. No, no. And, and we, get that, we can get that spirit in us. We can get fearful because we've been turned down so many times. But God is not concerned. I don't believe God is as concerned with the result as much as we are. He's more concerned with your, my consistency in our walk. I mean, consider with me a couple of two ways in which Paul uh, displayed consistencies here in verse 20 and 21. First of all, Paul was consistent no matter where the arena. In verse 20, it says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but, uh, but have shown you, showed you rather, and have taught you publicly and from house to house. You see, it mattered not to Paul whether he was out in public with a crowd in front of him, or in the privacy of someone's home. His message was the same. It was consistent throughout. He kept nothing back. He laid, if you will, he laid all his cards on the table. He had nothing to hide. Paul, Paul didn't try to shield the truth. He didn't try to massage the truth. He didn't try to compromise the truth to make it more palatable. Paul preached it straight and true, no matter what arena he found himself in. In a church, in a motel, in a, uh, at work, wherever. He was the same. But secondly, notice that Paul was consistent, yea, no matter where the arena, but also no matter who the audience. In verse 21, we read these words, testifying both to the Jews and also the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Jew or Greek, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian or Scythian, bound or free, it mattered not to Paul. <clears throat> For it matters not the background or the upbringing of an individual, because the need is the same in all. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All are in need of the two elements that are mentioned here in verse 21 repentance towards God, because it's Him that we have wronged, and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> for He has shed His blood for us. He's made salvation available. But it matters not who you are, where you come from, how much money you have or don't have. The need of man is universal to all. Repentance towards God and faith towards Jesus Christ for salvation. The pattern of Paul. Thus far, it's made up of compassion and consistency. But there's also another element in verse 22 and 23, that of compliance. Compliance. I mean, what a, what a tremendous statement this is here by the Apostle Paul. Think of it, he was forewarned that bonds and afflictions, persecution, 
hard persecution lay ahead in his future. Yet he was sure. He was sure that the Holy Spirit of God was leading him in that direction. And here, in spite of knowing that trouble lay just around the corner, Paul was compliant, not complaining. Paul was submissive to the will of God, not subversive, not fighting against it. Let me try to put it in simple terms, if you will. Regardless of how bitter the pill of God, Paul was interested in the will of God. Let me turn that around first. Let's start, first of all, by thinking about the will of God in verse number 22. In verse 22, we read, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things which shall befall me there. See, Paul was convinced that it was the will of God for him to go to Jerusalem, even though he wasn't sure what awaited him there. Reminds me of that illustration last night of the chocolate. Remember? We stick our thumb in the bottom and try to figure out what it is before we pop it in our mouth. We want to know what it contains. Well, I'm sure Paul would have liked to. But then, he was human like us. Don't we like to? Don't we know what's going to come? Don't we want to know what's going to come across the path of our lives tomorrow? I know I do. I'd like to. <laughs> but we're not granted that privilege. There are certain things that were revealed to Paul. In Paul's case, Jerusalem was a dangerous place for him to go. It was the, the headquarters of the opposition, I guess you could put it that way. He was going right into the lion's den. He might as well just turn himself in. He knew it. And so did others. In fact, look ahead with me to chapter 21, and look at verses 10 through 13 for just a moment. I mean, here in these verses, we find that well, some well-meaning Christians, believers, warning Paul, no, don't go, don't go to Jerusalem. They, 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 were, they were sincerely concerned for his well-being. But unfortunately, they were sincerely wrong. Look at 20, chapter 21, verse 10. It says, and as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Abigus. And by the way, this was a notable prophet because he is the one that prophesied the famine in Jerusalem and it came to pass. Verse 11, and when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth the girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Do you get the picture here? There's a group of people, five, six, ten, I don't know how many, they're all saying, No, no, Paul, we don't want you to go. Verse 13, then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready, not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Folks, good, well-meaning people will often attempt to stop you from doing what you know is God's will. They're well-meaning. They don't want to see you hurt. But, but we human beings don't know that these were believers. That this warning came from the Holy Ghost. So who was right in this case? Well, I, I'd have to say that Paul was. Why? Where did most of our epistles come from? Hand of Paul. While he was in prison, where these believers were trying to stop him. None of us knows the future. None of us knows what lies ahead for any of us. We can try to give counsel, but our counsel is not always right. Our counsel is often, how can I say it, often grounded in selfishness. I've known many a parent that didn't want their child to go to the mission field, serve God in a foreign country. So they told them that they fought against it. They, they said, no, don't go. And then, all right, they finally gave in, and they stayed, and they took some job and wound up walking away from God. <sighs> Sometimes our emotions can be our worst enemy. And I think that was the case here. But Paul was convinced, without a doubt, that he was to go to Jerusalem. Out of the experience that these well-meaning Christians attempted to stop him from experiencing, we have much of what we rely on for the orderly, decent and orderly uh, order of our church. Where would we be without all those things? <clears throat> that brings up, secondly, yeah, there is the will of God, but often there is the will of God. The pill of a personal suffering and sacrifice. Notice in verse 23 we read there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. The pill of personal suffering and sacrifice, it, that, that, it is a tough 
pill to swallow, a tough, hard piece of candy to chew, if you will. But just like, just like any horrible tasting medicine. Now, we don't serve it anymore, but remember when parents used to serve their kids castor oil? They did that just to make them. They just loved seeing them make that ah, face. No, that's not why they did it. Because that was the remedy of the day. That's why they did it. Uh, I, I go back so far, I, I remember a particular medicine I hated. It was called mercurochrome. Whenever you had a, a, an open wound, a brush burn or something, they mom would pull out this bottle and open the top, and there'd be a stick in there, and then she'd put this red stuff on your knee. And you would scream! <laughs> Maybe a clear illustration for today is somebody that's got cancer. It's curable with chemo. But who wants to go through chemo? But honestly, the medicine, yeah, the medicine may be hard. It may be a tough pill to swallow. But what about the alternative? Not walking with God, in this case, Paul realized it was more important for him to do the will of God, regardless of what the pill of God brought into his life. And, and you realize that, that, that for the lost, amongst us, it's the pill of God that they fear. They fear that God's going to ask them to give this up or, or do this or go to the mission field or do that, and, and they don't get saved because of it. They fear the pill of God and the gracious, wonderful will of God so much. Even some Christians, some believers, fear suffering that might, oh, God might call me to the mission field. Well, <clears throat> my brother Rowley that was just with us going to Papua New Guinea, going to a, a pretty mountainous region and there's no Walmarts. There's, there's barely electricity. And uh, uh, somebody, you know, questioned him, what about taking your family there? And, of course, the old saying is what he applied. It's safer to be in a dangerous place in the will of God than in a safe place outside of the will of God. Paul realized that fully. In fact, uh, Paul wrote these words in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He's writing to believers that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. We will give an account to God as to whether we took his pill and stayed in his will or not. The pattern of Paul. It involves compassion, consistency, compliance. Fourth of all, it involves courage. Verses 24 to 27. In, in case you hadn't noticed, and I'm sure you have, in case you hadn't noticed, it's not always easy to do the right thing. <laughs> it's not. Nothing, it, it's, it's not possible. It's not popular, rather, to do the right thing in our world today. We see that so very clearly in the political reign right now. Uh, it, it's just not popular. And that's why it takes courage to do the right thing. You're going against the flow. It takes courage to go against the flow of, of the error of the majority. It takes courage to exhibit the, the, the three elements that we've already looked at. And I want to run through them again real quickly. First of all, there is the courage to show compassion. You know, at this point, I, I want to take a moment to make clear just what true compassion is. True compassion is not looking the other way while the other person barries, bar barrels down the broad road to destruction. That, that's not compassion. That's actually selfishness. It's protecting ourselves from rejection, I guess you could say. True compassion is being genuinely concerned for, for that soul and for their eternity. True compassion is tenderly confronting them with the truth of God's Word. Let's face it, Paul preached an unwelcome message, and so do we. Paul faced bonds and afflictions, and he went through it. He stayed with it. Why? It says here in, our, in verse 24, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Look at verse 24 and 25. It says there, but none of these things move me. What an oh, incredible verse. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. He did it to testify, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to many people that just simply didn't even want to hear it in the first place. But nevertheless, all knew they needed it. And compassion for their souls, that, that's what drove him. That's what pushed him. It took courage for Paul to, to, uh, to, to show that kind of compassion. And it takes courage for you and I to show that kind of compassion. But secondly, then, notice that he had to, it takes courage to consistently. Look at verse 26 and 27. 
says, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I mean, we've already looked at this, but l- let me quickly say that to live a consistent, godly, separated, biblical testimony before a world that ridicules it, that calls it old-fashioned, that says it's outdated, that takes courage. Courage. Like the lion said in the Wizard of Oz, right? Courage. <clears throat> now, many today, many believers today, prefer to take the easy way out. A non-offensive way. They 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 want to they want to grab a hold of the popular, the the wonderful parts of the counsel of God, but they want little to do with the whole counsel, with the gospel, with the theology of God, because they lack the courage, and I think it's because some of them lack the Holy Spirit in the first place to do so. Paul exhibited courage to show godly compassion. Courage to show to, to live consistently. Thirdly, then, it takes courage to live in compliance. Verse 28, the Bible says there, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the flock of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Paul took heed to himself because he understood that no man liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. He lived in compliance of the Word of God because he understood the great effect that the way of life that your person lives has on those around them. Therefore, he courageously lived, compliant to God's Word, and was able to instruct the Ephesian elders to do likewise. Follow me as I follow Christ, he said. As I, as I comply my life to that of Jesus Christ, follow me as I follow Him. And, and again, it takes real courage to live the way Paul lived. Willing to do the will of God, regardless of the pill of God. The courage to say, not my will, thine be done. Nobody would argue that it took courage for Jesus to say those words. But are we willing to say them? And mean them? And live them? The pattern of Paul. Compassion, consistency, compliance, courage. Uh, fifth of all, concern. His concern. Notice, well, we look at verse 29, 30, and 31 in just a moment. But Paul was concerned that these people that he loved, concerned that they understood that the Christian life, it's not a bed of roses. It doesn't line up with the prosperity gospel. He was concerned that they understood the dangers involved, that there was a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. He was concerned that they understood the truth about the workings of our adversary, the devil. He's the one that wrote the most about it in our New Testament. In his concern, Paul warned them of two varieties of adversaries that you know are out there, but you know, sometimes we just get a little dull of hearing. Sometimes we forget that there are ambushes being laid all around us. He talked about adversaries from within there in verse 29. He says, Therefore I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. From the Scriptures, we understand that we face a subtle, seductive, and ruthless adversary our enemy, the devil, one that is a master of disguise. I think we forget that sometimes. He's a master of disguise. Here, here in this passage, out of concern for the flock of God, Paul warns them about grievous wolves. Those are strong words. You know, they're not nice-looking wolves. They're not, oh, they look a little angry. No, they're grievous. They're, they're brutal. Wolves that Jesus Christ warned us would appear in sheep clothing to deceive. Wolves that... Would not, he says here, they won't spare the flock. They don't care what, what, the, what consequences befall your life, what consequences befall the, the local church that they're attacking. They're just interested in stopping the Lord's church from moving forward. And then Paul, he didn't stop there. He also warned of adversaries from within. Verse 30 and 31, we read, Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Just just in the same way that Judas worked his betrayal from within the disciples, Satan will seek to, as Jesus said, sow tares amongst the weak. You know how he did it? Remember what's in that parable? While men slept. You see, if we drop our guard. If we fall asleep at the wheel, Satan will certainly sow some tears in the day while we slept. 
And he's done so in church after church after church over the centuries. So when when Jesus spoke that parable in Matthew chapter 13, he said this, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares amongst the weak and went his way. Folks, that's why Paul is exhorting these elders to watch and remember, for if they would sleep, Satan would surely sneak in and attack from the inside. I think it was, it used to be credited, I don't know if it still was, to Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of Russia at one time. And he said something, or someone said something to the effect that I can't defeat you from without. You're militarily too strong, not the United States. But I will defeat you from within. I do believe we're seeing that today. And that's exactly Satan's philosophy too. Now there's one more, at least one more, one more attribute, one more thing about Paul's pattern, along with compassion, consistency, compliance, courage, and concern, there's also his commitment in verses 32 to 38. Look at them with me one more time. He says, the Bible says there, therefore, uh, 32 rather, and now brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that, are, that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had spoken, and when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing. Most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. See, Paul was committed. And I know I've said this over and over and over and over and over again, but it's so important. Paul was committed to doing the will of God, even, even when it meant departing from these dear friends that he would never see again. Even if it meant never seeing them again. Paul understood that he had a higher calling. God had a higher purpose for his life, a call that went beyond food and raiment, a call that went beyond silver and gold, a call that went beyond the comforts of this world, the comforts that so quickly pass, so quickly they're gone, so quickly those things that we spend so much hard money on wear out and they wind up out on the curb with a trash can. Paul was committed to that higher calling. Look again at Paul's words in verse 24. Uh, again, I can't get away from these words. He says, but none of these things move me. I, 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 I'd love to hear a recording of this. I, I'd love to hear his voice inflection as he said that. Was it, was it a weepy voice? Cracking because of the emotion. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have uh, receive the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. By the way, we've received the same ministry as ambassadors of the Lord. But do we have that kind of commitment? Do we? Do you? I mentioned another one. I don't have it up on the outline on the screen, but another one that came to mind here, that we that are of the male of the species have the most trouble communicating. This kind of emotional we often don't, we, we don't want other men to see us cry. We don't want our wives to see us shed us. That's not what I see in this picture. We males, I, I see the ladies are smiling and giggling because <clears throat> I'm not picking on them. Because they don't have a problem with it. They'll just let the waters flow. Amen. <laughs> and, and just let the emotions out. But we got to look tough. <clears throat> That's not what I see Paul doing here. I see Paul expressing some heartfelt emotion. And I guess I go back to what I said in the beginning. He knows he's not going to see these people. You know, husbands, if you left the house in the morning, knowing that you would not come home, you would not see your wife again, how would you take her up? Rush out the door quickly? And wives too, ladies too, and, and church members too. If you, if this was the last time you were able to meet together at the church, you knew you weren't going to come back again uh, because, let's say, the government was going to shutter the place or whatever. You wouldn't be able to meet again. Would there be a difference in the way you depart for people? Maybe we need to think a little bit more about how fragile our relationship, our acquaintances are at times because none of us know what tomorrow holds. Paul had a glimpse, and, 
And it broke, brought forth these emotions that we have. I think we'd be far better if we'd be more in touch with our emotions from time to time. We weren't so rough. So I think we had to be the man. We might just have a, 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 a what do you say now? A better relationship with one another. Did so. <clears throat> you know, as Jesus Christ also did. Paul was committed to doing the work of the Father. Turn with me to one other passage of Scripture as I close. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. Paul was committed to doing the work that the Father had called him to do and to finish his course. Consider these wonderful words in verses 11 and 12. First, the 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 11 and 12, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The pattern of Paul, it's not an easy pattern. It takes conscious effort on our part. But for those that claim to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, it is indeed a worthy goal. Emulating these things, incorporating them in our life, it's a mark that we ought to be pressing toward. And actually, Paul was. Paul was pressing toward that mark. He made that clear in Philippians 3.14. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Folks, being a, being a Christian, being a believer is certainly a high calling, a, an honor. It's a privilege. Privilege that calls for us to exhibit compassion toward others. Consistency in our lives. Compliance to the Word of God. Courage to do right. The concern to warn others. The commitment to keep on keeping on and communicate with one another. Our heart's feeling. Even though the whole world might oppose you, you keep pressing on for Christ. Remember His words, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. The pattern of Paul. First of all, it, it cannot be done without a person first humbling themselves and throwing themselves at the Lord's feet, confessing their sin and, and requesting His forgiveness. And then after that, it cannot be duplicated until first Jesus Christ is Lord of lords, the Lord of our lives. First for salvation and then for service. The Bible says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. Very simply, in God's economy, humility comes before honor. No matter how much man tries to reverse that order, God's order stands. Humility first, honor second. Let me challenge you again to, take, to think of these six, actually seven things, and examine yourself. Are these things evident in my life in the same way that they were in the life of the Apostle? I, you know, this, the way our world is right now, I think that compassion, that's probably the hardest thing. Show compassion to those that are so vehemently against things to come. And yet, that's what Jeremiah did. That's what others have done before. And we shed, shed some tears for our nation, for our world, for our world. Dear precious Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I pray, dear Lord, now your blessing on this time of closing. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that I was a blessing in some way to this church over these two messages. Lord, uh, I, I just, can any of us imagine how much sweeter our fellowship would be in the house of God here at New Testament Baptist? Every one of us exhibited these qualities. Every one of us incorporated the pattern of Paul. Oh, how sweet it was.